going on? I mean, I hate these. Uh, uh, I mean, well, you know the difference between British and um, I mean, so Europeans when they say how are you doing, they like literally want an answer, and Americans it's like a greeting. How's it going? Like you'll say that to a stranger on the street, how's it going? And they go, fine, and they keep walking, and it apparently perplexes Europeans because if you ask a European how are you doing, they're going to be like, oh, I guess I'm getting uh, interrogated. Yeah, I actually kind of like hearing people's actual answers, so maybe I'm more European, but a sunny one because Americans are supposed to be sunny. Well, oh, no, so no. So back on the literal answer, I don't – I mean I think I'm doing well. I think everything's well. How are you doing? Okay. I have animals here who are somewhat restive, so you may see a cat be uh, streaking Dude, across my lap at some point. I got hold on. I got to introduce uh, introduce you to my new my new little buddy. This is our newest. Oh wow! Our newest our newest poodle. We've had six now. This is number six. This is Bella. Wow! And she's a little nine week old standard poodle puppy, Bella Kinsella. So <laughs> okay, very good. Very good. Yeah, we have two older ones. One's called Louis von Mises Kinsella, and uh, my, I wanted I wanted them to like die off and have no poodles, no dogs for a while, but my wife uh, refuses. So now we have three, which is a pain. Well, they require some effort, right? They do. We're house training here. We're we're building a new house, and so my wife's. Th- this is how my wife thinks. We should get the new dog now because in a year or two we move into our new house. She'll already be house trained. Like, yeah, great. Well, that's an interesting idea. That's 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 thinking ahead. That's yeah. that's this is how this is how time old, horizon. That's how. Uh, yeah, she's very. Yeah, she's she has a a long uh, high time uh, low time preference. Uh, that's there true. it is, low time preference. Yeah, drinking diet coke at ten in the morning or nine thirty in the morning. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm afraid that this is my biggest vice. So. Uh, well, you know, you could have worse vices. I drink a lot more Diet Coke than whiskey. Let's just put it that way. So uh, what's up with you? I saw you last in person, what, five or so years ago with, when we did our little tour yeah. through the, the, right. the, 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 the West Coast. Yeah, I'm just uh, in stasis pretty much. Uh, nothing much has changed. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Okay, so we're doing a podcast. I, I guess we're doing a podcast. podcast. I guess we're doing a podcast. You're not a good marketer, are you? Because we're on this private list together. I've never even heard you mention it. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Um, well, I'm trying to get good at it before I start talking about it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, talking is not my strong suit, so it's uh, taking some time for me to get used to this whole thing. No, your strong suit is sending me rejection letters uh, for Liberty Magazine. Well, I was good at that. Yeah, you were. Very polite. <laughs> Don't want that article right I now. was wondering how long it would take you to bring that up. Like we may begin right with that. <laughs> That's our history, but the funny thing was I I vaguely remembered your name, Verkala, and I saw some of your articles, but remember when we started talking, was it Facebook or something? I mean, this must be fifteen years ago, ten years and you were using Workman at the time, right? And you're back on Timo now. I think you used to be Timothy, then you went to Workman for a while, now you're Tim Timo again, or I don't know. Well, it, it depends on what, what crowd are you marketing to. I mean, every 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 discussion is a marketing effort, as you just sort of suggested. And uh, Workman is just sort of a brand I use so people can find me online. Right. And I you, heard that, and I, I assumed it was a NIM because I'm so used to libertarians making up these, like, you know, I'm Liberty Valhalla, whatever. They always do these things, right? Michael Malice and I are good friends now, but at first I was really snarky to him because – I assumed Michael Malice was a um, – I'm not going to actually go there. I assumed it was a NIM, and like I'm instantly ho- – I mean I don't mind if you want to use a NIM, but I'm instantly hostile. Like if you're a longstanding NIM, right, and you use it for a while, like uh, Minch's Moldbug, right? Everyone knows he's Curtis Jarvin, so he's not hiding. So he has an identity you can go after. I just I'm always skeptical of these guys that make up a new identity. They come and they dive bomb into a conversation and it's like you can't even like talk with them as a human because they're they're ephemeral, right? They they have no they have nothing to lose. They have um, no reputation. No one knows who they are. 
not that you want to dox everyone, but it's like what's I, – I just – I'm always – I. As soon as I get the impression someone's a NIM, I instantly – my meter goes up for like, okay, you have a higher bar to meet. So I did that temporarily with you because I was stupid, and I thought Workman was a NIM, but it's just it's just one of your, uh, what, Finnish, Swedish, what, whatever. Uh, Workman region. is the Friesian version of Virkula, and it's in the family book dating back to 1546. So it's oh, there so for a long is, your time. Your name is Virkula Virkula? Kind of, you know. <laughs> if you want to put it that way, so but like I mean, that's Gar- just, you're that's like just... Garrett, 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 or Garrett. Oh, that's one of my. By the way, that is kind of the reasons I sometimes use it because it's just it 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 pleases me to no end to be somehow allied with Garrett Garrett because he I is like, in my no my idea. favorite I stylist. Say, uh, I didn't know it was a synonym though. Um, well, do you, let me ask you a question. Uh, we're already rambling. Are you recording? Because I'm yeah. recording oh. just as a backup. Oh, geez, I forgot to rec- start recording. Yeah, well, I'm you glad, see, that's I'm why glad I you record. mentioned. So, uh, yeah, okay. Well, here we are. Record. We're recording. We're recording. And then you can use mine if you want to use the first six minutes. Um, if mine works, because Skype has this. Have you noticed Skype has this new feature, right? Where I you just can noticed in that. the app. I, I've just noticed that. However, what I like about I'm using eCam, which is something yeah. I bought to put on side of it, me too. and that gives me some interesting abilities in terms of yes. the kind of qual- quality yep. I get. I agree. You can do separate audio tracks and all that. Um, I have Ecamm, but I don't have it installed on my new computer. So I was going to install it for a talk I did the other day, and I realized that Skype now has a built-in uh, recording mode. And the cool thing is it's in the cloud, but I haven't checked the features of it. So I'm doing it as a backup, so we'll see. But, um, um, yeah, so anyway. Um, you have thinking smart? Anyway, we're talking something about names, I think, is that what we were talking about. Oh, well, Garrett, Garrett. uh <laughs> Yeah. Do you like Garrett Garrett, by the way? You know, I haven't read my. Oh, I was going to ask you if you ever accepted uh, Justin Romando's uh, kind of conspiracy theory that uh, Ayn Rand plagiarized Atlas Shrugged from his book, The Cinder Buggy, or whatever it was. Because there was a guy named Reardon, or, you know, or something. I mean, there was. It was about an industrialist. You know, there's a couple of superficial similarities. Yeah, it's not very convincing. I'm yeah. not saying that Ayn Rand didn't actually, it's probably cryptomnesia. Literally what happened, what they say happened to Vladimir Nabokov with Lolita. Yeah. But yeah. but I think that in his case, I mean, Ayn Rand's case, she what probably read the Cri- book. Cri- cryptomnesia? Cryptomnesia. Yeah, which I is can the, see that. Uh, you, for, you forget it and then it, it, you think you invented it yourself. Yeah. I actually have a oh. fear of cryptomnesia. Yeah. It's almost paralyzing sometimes. Because oh, I read enough a, 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 thousand, a thousand times. Time. I never think I did it. I always have a vague sense that I think I got this from someone, but I can't remember where or when in the midst of time, which is part of the problem with, with IP, right? It's like th- this obsession with uh, – meaning intellectual property, copyright. This obsession with uh, you have to give credit to the original authors, otherwise it's plagiarism, which is not even the argument for patent and copyright. But this kind of obsession that uh, – well, just come up with your own stuff. Don't – it's like, well, everyone borrows from things, and they're influenced by things, and they mix things together. And no one – almost no one is this weird mintat genius who keeps a trail of every single inspiration, and they mark it down. They can footnote it later. This is not how normal life works, you know. Right. Uh, you know, people. There are very few the Bible Teslas down, right? too. Tesla. There are very few Teslas in this world who actually invent new yeah. things that no one ever thought of before. Well, I, and I don't even know if Tesla did that. I mean, I, I think they were all geniuses, and they were part of the incremental advance of the sciences. But um, I, I tend to think that the way science and technology develops, which is the field of patents, is that. Um, Number one, an idea can't come before its time is ready because there's just not the the, the groundwork laid, right? Um, although you know, you know, people thought of things a thousand, two thousand years ago, uh, flying machines, but they just couldn't. They didn't have the technology to do it. But when when you start getting all the other sciences and the math and the and the technological production ready for something, people. And, but, but then I think it's basically inevitable. That's why you usually have two, three, four people. I mean, wasn't Tesla one of several people working on different 
Westinghouse and uh, Edison and all these guys like all competing at the same time for roughly the same uh, terrain. So well, they were certainly on the same terrain, but Tesla did AC and you know Edison was working on DC and and yeah. the, and AC is quite a quite a mental conceptual breakthrough. DC is kind of straightforward, but AC is very different. Oh so. yeah. I'm actually an electrical engineer, as you might remember, uh, and so I loved all. That's one reason I loved all that stuff. I loved the, not the philosophy behind it really, but just the the mentality behind some of these ideas. Um, how, you know how uh, AC has some advantages, DC has some advantages, right? Like AC can be converted easily from one voltage to another because it's a sinusoidal wave, right? So you can have a transformer induction sort of action. DC is harder to convert, but on the other hand, DC doesn't go back and forth, so it doesn't have as much friction, so to speak, in the wires. So you can you could send high voltage DC across longer distances on power lines without as much loss because it's not oscillating, right? But if it doesn't oscillate, then you have your own problems, and if it's high voltage, you have another problem, which is danger, right? So. Uh, it's dangerous, but yeah, the whole, that whole stuff, uh, all that stuff, all that whole field fascinates me. But I've never been into Tesla too much, except from you know that movie, uh, that movie where the magicians disappear or something. Oh, the Prestige. Yeah, the Prestige. Yeah, well, that's an amazingly good movie, uh, based on a very good science fiction novel by Christopher Priest. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, that's, that's a favorite. Though I don't think that that's I wouldn't exactly go to uh, that movie for my ideas on Tesla. So. Uh, uh, no, I know. That's what I mean. I mean, so you hear about Tesla from the sort of, you know, what do you call what do you call the turn of the the fin de siècle? The I love, Jeff Tucker and I sometimes joke about these uh, all these fancy terms for uh, uh, the Belle Epoque, you know, the beautiful era, the you know, eight, basically eighteen eighties to the nineteen twenties, right? Like this kind of amazing. So I think there's fin de siècle, turn of the century. There's, which I'm probably mispronouncing because I don't speak. French, I guess that's French. That's French. And uh, Belle Epoque, I guess that's another French term. Be yeah. The beautiful arrow. There's another. Oh, Gilded Age, the Gilded Age. And that's very American. That was given to us by Mark Twain. That term. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's kind of odd about the. We could talk about the Gilded Age. Actually, that's kind of interesting because uh, because that's also the age coming out of the Civil War, which is right. certainly a strange time in American history. Well, I was just reading – I was listening to a podcast a, a, a day or two ago with uh, – oh, God. It, it, I think it might have been Thaddeus Russell or Tom Woods, one of those guys because they, they're, they're some of my favorites. But uh, I think I think it was Tom Woods. They were talking about the uh, – um, yeah, it was Tom Woods interviewing uh, Herbener. That's what it was, Tom Woods interviewing Jeffrey Herbener. And they ended up getting to this uh, this forgotten recession of 1921, 22, something like that, which Tom's written about and Herberner's studied. But they were talking about the precursors to it, which was like from like the 1880s to about the 1900s. There was this kind of weird uh, like flip flop of what you think of now as the Republicans and Democrats. Like the Democrats wanted to, especially after the, after World War One, the Democrats wanted to like uh, uh, get fiscal responsibility and restrain spending and restrain inflation and prices, and the Republicans wanted the opposite. So it's so almost like the opposite of now. But uh, that was before yeah, World War. That whole, but you could be right. I, th I thought it was. Uh, I thought they were trying to restore prices to the level they had been before World War One. So, like after, and which which, which it had something to do with that 1921, 22 episode. But oh, yeah, there was something in the 1880s when all this. Yeah, I, my history is really weak on this stuff, but it's fascinating. It is amazing. I've been I've, I dip into it quite a bit, but I, you know, I don't retain everything I read, which is one of those unfortunate things about getting old. Um, I think I think by the way, I, I think I heard that there's a uh, well. This is about nine months or a year ago. I think there's a series in the works for net, like Netflix or Amazon or HBO. It's called The Gilded Age, and so it looked like one of these high quality prestige, you know, uh, cable TV drama things, which was going to be set from like you know probably the late 1880s to the early 1800s, which could have been interesting, right? The Rockefellers and 
sure. Vanderbilt, all that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, they'll you know you and I both know they'll mangle it totally. They'll have to, of course, portray them as insidious evil demons in the, in the background. But you know it could have been interesting. But I have a feeling COVID might have uh, delayed all that. I How guess are you doing COVID, by the way? Um, well, you know that's kind of an interesting story because I had a strange illness in February. Okay. Uh, it lingered from February through March. I had two bouts of it, uh, sapped nearly all of my energy, dry cough, not phlegm. Uh, I even had a um, marker for a, a rash. But did I have it? I don't know. Oh, you mean you think you might have had COVID? Yeah, I might have. Early. And... Yeah. The fact that so many people we know had a strange flu in December, January, February, and March, and it was all over the place. I mean, it was in England and on the West Coast especially, but they never talked about it. They never talked about if there's a non, if there's a strange flu going on that's not COVID, we never heard about it from the, uh, the important people. It made me very skeptical about the whole thing from the beginning. Yeah, I, I, I don't know where you're on this. Uh, I think you're more into conspiracies than I am, but um, I tend to think that the number of deaths is probably overcounted, but the number of cases is probably undercounted. But I don't know. I really don't know. That's been my I don't care to be honest. Because I don't, I, I don't care about things I can't affect. So, what can you do? I mean, either this huge tsunami of grief is coming, or I mean, and it already has in a way because of the response to it, if nothing else. Yeah, um, that's a very stoic or Epicurean attitude of, your, of yours. Very Hellenistic, I should say. Oh, my that wife you... and I, like, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm not, like, most people I talk to, they, my dad, my wife, other people, they, they ask these questions like A, B, and C, like, what should I do in this case? And I'm like, what does it matter because – What's coming is coming, and you can't – like your little actions won't affect it. So, yeah, I think you should accept yeah, – it's also the – yes, the Irish poem, like, God give me the grace to know the difference, with, you know, that kind of thing. Right. It's common sense in a way. Like don't get excited about things. Like my wife always wants to un uh, bury the un – uh, dig into the details of things that really won't matter, like if you know them or not. Like, well, I want to find out what this guy would, would have charged or is going to charge or, you know, things like that. And I'm like, yeah, but we already have a contract. We're going to have to pay it no matter what. And if we do this, this is going to. So we're, we're going to do the. Uh, we know what we're going to do. So whatever's coming is coming. We don't know it yet. And people don't like to look at things like that. So, so I, I, I like to try to make people say, like, so what's your action? What's your point? What's your goal? And they'll they'll finally admit something like, "Well, I just want to know." They'll say that. It's so like, "Yeah, okay, but then what are you going to do?" Because whether it's A or B, it's not going to affect your your actions. We we just we just settled that. So what's the point of knowing? Just wait for it to happen, man. But yeah, some people just are anxious. They want to fucking know. I have a slide. Like, let me like, let me give you let me give you a stupid okay. example. So my my dad, who I love, he's eighty two. He's in Louisiana. I helped him get set up on this account called Freshly, which they order food. Um, and because he and my mom are landlocked, and you know, so he gets this food from Freshly. It's prepared food in a in a box, right? Mm -hmm. It's not frozen. It's prepared food that you get. And you can microwave it. It's just a meal. Um, and so they accidentally. So he he did it on his own. He got it set up, but then they sent him like. 12 extra meals like last week and he called me all in a tizzy about it number one wanting me to give him the phone number which you know because if you're 82 you don't have to go freshly.com and find the phone number but this is how dads do like they you know looking for excuses to call their kids or they just want to call for a helpline and they know that the helpline at the company is going to suck so they call their smart 54 year old son to you know what I mean? This is how this is how it goes. But the funny thing was, I just said, Dad, why do you want their phone number? Because you know, you or I, like if you like if you order a book from Amazon and it gets to your house and it's scuffed up, you don't call Amazon. 
like there's no phone number to call and talk to a human. You know what I mean? And you both, we all know what it's futile. So you either <clears> give it away, you accept the loss, or you just order another one. Or you, you know, you know how you and I would deal with it. But he wants to call them, and I said, "Why do you want to call him?" He's like, "Well, I want to know what I should do with this extra food." I said, "Dad, you're going to talk to some chick in Minnesota or maybe Taiwan or Vietnam. I mean." She's just going to tell you what you – I mean, use the food or get rid of it. You know. So he, finally, so he finally admitted, well, he really wanted not to be charged for the extra food. I said, okay, that's reasonable. Okay. So you finally admitted what so – he, but he first said, I want to call him and see what I should do with this food. You know. But it's a whole different generational attitude towards everything, customer service. Internet op, internet things, you know, giving your credit card out online, that kind of stuff. Sorry, ranting and ranting and dissembling, but uh, I just find people's reactions to all this stuff to be amazingly interesting because it's always so different. Some people treat some things so differently; they will spend three hours trying to debug an issue, which other people know how to debug in two seconds or two minutes, or they just blow it off. But some people just can't do that. Yeah. Um, regarding COVID, which is something I can speak to, is is that I'm actually very fascinated about what is happening, and you know, not not to the point that I'm actually studying it in depth, but I do keep track of you know the various theories and bits of information, uh, and I have my own theories, blah blah blah. But the point that I'm I'm not ang- anxious about it because once again, there they did, how is it going to affect me? Well, I might die because of it. That's true, but you know I might die any day now. I mean, this is yeah. after, after you're after after you're fifty, certainly after yeah. you're sixty. You don't. There's no reason to be anxious about death anymore. I mean, no. You've already uh, you, uh, after you're fifty or sixty, you've already sort of uh, everything's surplus now. Like it's all just like uh, in Louisiana they call land yap. It's a little bit extra. It's like yeah, yeah. Just be grateful. That By the way, your COVID hair doesn't look too bad. Your COVID hair looks pretty cool. It looks I mean, you're a biker, right? So it looks well, like Well, I was. I haven't have. been out in quite a long time, but yeah, yeah. I used to have very long hair. What, what, in the days where I rejected your uh, uh, submissions, I had very long hair. <laughs> <laughs> to get the chicks? No, no. It's a kind of a dumb story. Uh, it's just a, it's one way people adapt. And I, I couldn't, at that time, I could not wear closed face helmets. So, and but that meant that I had open faced helmet, and yeah. the ha- if I had normal hair with the bangs or something, it would get in my eyes. So the only way to get it out of my eyes was to pull it all back, and that required longer hair. So I had long hair for ten years, and then I decided I looked like an idiot. So uh, at that point, I decided that for everybody's good, society's and mine, right. and you I look would... you look like Jesus. I mean, come on, oh, what's wrong with looking like Jesus? Okay, you know Wait he probably minute. had so... short haircut. Uh, no, I never heard that one. But you know, he's a Jew. I, well, he probably did. he probably didn't exist. But okay. Well, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, there are too many Jesuses, too many options for who, who he was. So there's there's Hotep Jesus. Yeah, there you are. Um, so what's this thing about closed and open helmets? So, uh, like, if you take a typical street bike rider who's going down the interstate, like Peter Fonda. Uh, I thought everyone wore open-faced helmets, pretty much. I I wear a closed face now. I have a one that flips up like this. If I when when I when I come to a stop, it, it's too suffocating for me. Oh, a mask, you know. We all know about masks now, and uh, yeah. yeah. And so I use one of those, and and I got used to it. I got used to having it. Has, it's a double visor. I mean, the, the 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 clear part can go up, and then the whole thing the whole thing can go up. And that allows me to run around with a much safer helmet. Uh, having having a front oh. bar is much safer. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so that's the idea. It's just it's safer. It's like f- full full head protection or something like that. Right. I got you. You're kind of um, low on the screen. Well, right I, now. I, You're kind of low on the screen now. Sorry. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I used to ride dirt bikes all the time. I've never ridden a street bike because I'm I'm terrified of them. And um, plus, I have a wife now. And you know, when you have a wife. Your freedom gets diminished. So, 
Harry Brown might have had a point, right, about never get married because it's like <laughs> an, it's unlibertarian. It's a restriction on your freedom. Um, no, so I can't I can't ever ride a street. I've always wanted to ride a street bike, to be honest, because I've I've rode di dirt bikes all my life and I love them, love them, love them, love them. But I never had a closed face helmet. It was always this was back in the eighties and nineties. It was always open face that I recall. Um, well, that was before good technology. <laughs> That's basically. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, I remember when I was riding these bikes, and they would say, "Oh, now we have something called mono shock." Like, it occurred to someone one day, if you're going to have a spring action and on your rear wheels, why not just use one spring instead of two? You know, and um, um, and all these all these innovations are crazy. Oh, on the other hand, the price is insane too. I'm never sure if it's because technology is so much better or because inflation. But I mean, I remember I bought my first like a Honda XR80 and then a 100 and then a uh, and then a 2 whatever it was uh, back in the like mid late, late 80s. We're talking $400, $900, $1000, dollars $1, $1100. Now they're like, you know, eight thousand dollars for a brand new, um, stacked out, you know, Honda XL two fifty, or whatever. Um, and I wonder if they're just that much better, or if it's just pure inflation. I guess it's a combination, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I uh, looked at a new uh, Honda, the small wheel, sort of like their version of a Vespa. It's a real cool looking kind of scooterish yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, half yeah. dirt bike, half scooter. I'm not sure what you would say about it. It's like a 250. And yeah. I asked the young man who was riding it, and he said, eh, it's about 3,300 bucks. New, brand new. Brand new. Of course, yeah. I don't buy things brand new like that. I'm not going to buy. Well, you don't need. New. You don't. I mean, you don't actually need to. Like, you could. Yeah, you could get a used one for what? What one third the price or something right. like that. So, yeah, of course. Right. Um, and the great thing about bikes is that there's a lot of people who buy bikes that never use them. Correct. Yeah, so you can get a really good one. Yeah. Yeah, that would be me. Um, yeah, it's been one of my fantasies in my fifties to like get back to dirt bike riding. I haven't ridden it in like twenty years because. You know, when you live the suburban sort of lifestyle, I mean, there's just no, there's no time for it when you have kids and careers and wives, and then there's nowhere to put it because right. your wife doesn't want like a trailer in her front yard like we used to do in Louisiana, you know? Right, right. And standards in our neighborhood. I mean, and there's no room in the garage. I mean, where do you put it? And there's no industry. So here's the thing if I could go once a month, and go ride a bike and rent it, it would be the heaven for me. But there's not an industry for that. You know you know what I mean. Like you can't go as far as I know, at least around Houston, Texas, there's no like dirt bike park within a hundred mile radius where there's a, a a company that has bikes you can just go and rent them on the day you need them and equipment and everything. Because no one does that. Everyone that rides has their own crap. You know what I mean? Right. So there's just not a market for it. Yeah. A market. I'd have to like hire, you know, some storage unit out a hundred miles from my house and put a trailer in it, put a bike in it, get a trailer hitch on my car, hire a mechanic to go out there and do all everything for me on occasion that I used to do as a young seventeen year old who knew how to do everything. You know, it's like the whole everything like becomes exponentially, like literally, probably a hundred times more in terms of overhead cost, and then you barely use it. Um, but that's my dream, actually. I, I want to get back to dirt bike riding someday. Okay, I love it. It's one of my favorite activities. Oh, you okay. know, there's. I mean, if you if you could like name the top two or three or four or five most fun things to do in life, I mean, we all know what they are, right? It's, it's you know, it's 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 sex with women. Number one, that's obvious, right? Uh, Fritos with French onion dip, right? Um, dirt bike and maybe snow skiing. Snow skiing is fun too, but okay. I'd say dirt bikes. Dirt bikes okay. is up there. Okay, I would probably put. And I have a feeling the street bikes are up there, but I I haven't had that pleasure yet. Uh, but, oh, it's so, an, it, I, I love it, but it's not it's not the same thing in many ways. Well, it's a much more genteel activity. 
Right. I know. I know it's different, and but it, I I feel the tug of it. But I just can't go there because I know so many guys that just they've been totally killed or their lives ruined because because some car fucks up and smashes the guy. The good thing about dirt bikes is you know it's just you against the trees, and you know what? If I hit a tree, it's my fault. But I can control that. But okay. you can't control an idiot in an SUV or a woman on her cell phone. You know. You know what I mean? You, 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 that's what you can't control. That's the problem. Right. Well, the, there's a few tricks. One is that you do not drive in and around cities when there's traffic. That, that is, that's, that's a very important thing. And the other is that there are things you can do when you approach cars on the road. Like where I live right now, this is actually the ideal bike uh, motorcycle riding area because there isn't that much traffic on the highways. The highways are generally safe. And if somebody's coming at you, and that is a problem for a motorcycle because people can do the craziest things. Well, then you, I, I mean, I, I make, a, I do things. Like I start weaving a little bit in, within my lane. Uh, just that alone, it's not so they cool, see. right? You have to remind them that you exist, even if it's innocuous, because people... Uh, well, and I think there's all these strobe lights now, and there's all these kind of uh, colorful vests people wear, and they, you know, they do things, right, that attract attention, which makes sense. Right. The other thing is, just no matter what speed you have to go, get away from other cars in your lane. Yeah. I mean, you just, you can't be around other vehicles, basically. That's just not a good idea in motorcycle riding. Uh, but try explaining that to a policeman who's wondering why you're going 90 miles an hour on a country road. That's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting conversation. I guess if he rides a, uh, if he rides a motorcycle, he understands. Yeah, yeah. But if he doesn't, then you're, you're screwed. Yeah. I have, I have a fun relationship to traffic cops. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting relationship. I've had, I've actually used in court the theory of risk homeostasis. So that's uh, that's one up for me. Risk, risk homeostasis. That's Sam Peltzman's huh. theory, basically, of uh, that one comp has a basic risk, a risk level one wants to maintain. So if one is safer in one realm, let's say made safer by a safety belt or something, one tends to compensate by more reckless behavior uh, than you would have uh, without the safety measure. Oh, it's like conservation of risk or something. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hold on, I'm stepping away to check you're, something. But I'm and now I, I now I see your uh, background screen. It's a, you, you've vanished. It is as if it were a science fiction uh, scenario. I know it's crazy. You're I'm an using, alien. I'm not even use, I'm not even using a green screen. I'm just using my my Skype special magical special effects. Yeah, it's quite it's quite the thing. And that's yeah. just simply well, to, to get rid of. Excuse me. Oh well, I'm just I just do it because I'm just. Uh, I'm just in a bedroom, which is not interesting. I, I'm not in my study. In my new house, I'm going to have a study where I can I have I'll have an interesting uh, intellectual background like you have. Okay. Um, but w w since COVID, my son, who's a, a high school senior now, he's he's taking courses online. So he took over our study downstairs to do his work, and then my wife took over my study to do her her work. And then we made a little office in the bedroom for me. So, you know, everyone's doing this stuff, right, right. Um, in COVID. So uh, it's just it's just not a great uh, – well, it's, it's fine. I don't care. I'm just – I just like to play around with technology is the real, on it, is the real answer. Um, do you – in your practice, do you go to the office much at all anymore? No. So here's the deal. Um, my practice is for about seven, eight, nine years now. Um, I quit. I quit this job I had, which was an, as an employee, as an in-house counsel, as a general counsel of a of a high tech company. Um, in, uh, about uh, thirty minutes outside of my house here in, in Houston, but um, I still, I still, I still do their some of their patent work for them as my client now. So I basically, um, I'm just a solo patent lawyer working from home so i don't i mean my office is my home my office is my laptop anywhere i am i could do my work it's easy it's a weird thing i don't need assistance anymore i don't need staff um and right. Uh, right. so 
I don't go anywhere. Now I ha- actually have an office at that at that laser company. They gave me an office, and I, I I was going there every couple of weeks, like to check in and to use their office and to get out of the house. But uh, no, I just stay here now. And so my wife does too. She she works in downtown Houston usually as an oil trader for Shell. And my son usually goes down the street for high school. But so everyone's just here, and you know we're the type of modern techno 21st century yuppies that we can still do things from home um not everyone can do that you know certain jobs right require uh presence you know right yeah or physical interaction or whatever it used so, to be the case that nearly yeah. every job did but now there's an increasing yeah, of course, number of jobs of what i've been in, doing in, i can do anywhere as well i i take my ipad wherever i want to go and i do my work there what are you doing, like editing and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. What kind of uh, do you do? You use the iPad with the uh, with the keyboard? Sometimes, but you know, if yeah, I'm in a you restaurant, to, if you're going to edit documents. What? If you're going to edit documents, you, you the keyboard is like I think it's essential. But well, the way I do it, often I don't. Uh, I can you can it's the iPad is an amazing device. It's a very easy to use. Um, like I say, if I'm writing and want to write fast, I'll use the uh, keyboard. And some yeah. editing, I use the keyboard. But you know, you you can click and you can do everything you need to on a on a iPad. Oh yeah, because you're yeah. I see edit. So writing and editing are different. Okay, if you're writing a lot, yeah, I think you really need. That <laughs> no, well, that's just me because I actually <laughs> I can actually type. So I, if I don't have a keyboard, I'm hobbled. Um, and the little keyboard on my little my little old iPad is. It's great. I love this little thing. You, I don't know if you have one of those. You know the little thing. The now the new one, the Magic Keyboard, I hear is an awesome on the iPad <clears> Pro. <throat> but it's it's kind of a major ordeal. It like it makes it basically as big as a MacBook or a MacBook Air almost. So right. I'm thinking like, yeah, why 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 not just use a MacBook? But um, but I understand it. But yeah, to me this fascinates me. Like. What you can do with these little devices. I mean, to be honest, you probably know this. You can theoretically, you could probably do a lot of what you want to do in your iPhone or something like that, or an Android phone. Right. Though like, it's harder. It's to amazing see. what you can do now. Yeah. They're harder to see, but you could get a screen. You could get a portable screen. You could get a portable keyboard. I mean, there's all these like kludges that. Yeah. The the thing is, the kludges usually it's like just just get an iPad with a with a keyboard, but uh. Yeah, I'm 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 pretty much committed to. I, if it weren't for just a few apps, or some software on my computer, I probably would just use iPads all the time. But I would love to only use an iPad because they update all the time, instantly. You know, it's no it, like everything's in the cloud. Um, but just for what the the way I use them, like I do a lot of alt tabbing, cutting and pasting, right, and things that they're just so much more. Even today, they're, they're so much more uh, onerous on the, on an iPad just because they're not designed for that kind of – yeah, but if you just wanted to check email and edit some things and use Google Docs and you know check the web and have your apps that do A, B, and C for you, I agree. Uh, well, I have a computer. Yeah, it's uh... – But I bet you do. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sitting in front of my computer. I have a Mac Pro here with a with a big screen here. Uh, I used to have two screens, but a for Mac some reason Pro. my second screen went out. You have a Mac Pro, the one that's the cylinder or an old? No, one? this is this is legacy. This is from 2010. Oh, so this might be a classic at some point. Well, it's still it's still it's still um, it's still not vintage and it's not obsolete, but it's going to be obsolete in a year or two probably. But uh, because the latest version of Mac OS X doesn't work on it, and uh, the last two, and I'm going to upgrade it to get the penultimate. But at some point, it's going to go. But I don't know. With, since I use the iPad so much, the idea of upgrading my Mac. It, yeah, my it's crazy. Phone. I agree. It's crazy. It's like why? Well, so here's a funny thing. So like on Zoom, so you know, like I was, I'm using this background on Skype. Uh, uh, right. Ever since the COVID things, Zoom has sort of taken over, but they're all trying to compete with each other, and so they have this – you can put a background up, right? Um, by the way, if you put a green screen up, it can be even better. They, they have a sure. better technology, at least with Zoom. Um, 
But the, so here's the funny thing. They said that like well, I have like three MacBooks. This is a brand new MacBook Air that we're using right now um, that I'm using right now. And um, so I can do on Zoom, I can do these backgrounds like 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 this and th they can be gift backgrounds too. They can move. They don't they can be movies. They don't have to be static. Right. right. But but my old MacBooks, which are like three years old or, or two years, they're not that they can't do it because they don't have the right processor. They just can't keep up with the video stuff. However, my two or three year old Mac uh, iPad can. So the video processing and the processing power in these iPads is really incredible, right? I mean, because it's so dedicated and it's so solidly locked into like it's like a more of a bulletproof uh, OS, right? Um, it is kind of Steve Jobs' dream. He's finally got. He finally had the thing that he yeah. really wanted all along. I think, with his original Macintosh idea, this is actually the iPad is the is the culmination of that whole trend. Almost, yeah, I think. It, I think it's just the the problem is the 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 the, the interface, the the input output, and uh, I just still don't see that happening. But for most people, yeah, I mean. Yeah. I'm actually a little bit worried that Apple's just going to discontinue the Macs because it's like, eh. Or, you well, know, they might keep the Pros, but they might discontinue Macs because most people is good enough for 90% of their market, and I, I'll be screwed because I actually have a need. Now, you really but, like the the Air. You've been talking up the Air for years now. Well, I like the MacBook, actually, the one that came out about three years ago, which was smaller than the Air because they were going to let the Air go – kind of expire and they came up with a new macbook which is even smaller so it was better for me on airplanes and travel which i'm not doing anymore who knows when i'll do that again um it was lighter thinner smaller than the than the air the macbook was amazing that's why i've, I've still got two because i'm keeping them as legacies but, but eventually they're going to do what yours is doing like yeah, I, they can't run certain things but um like they can't run the background on zoom Right. So that so they tell you you need a with your MacBook you need a green screen. Well, I have a I have a I have a Mac Pro, not a MacBook, a Mac Pro. Yeah, I know, but that's what I'm saying. So you but you said your old, old Mac Pro, uh, there's certain limitations like things is still it's like he or didn't you say there was something it can't do? Well, the, the newest do operating not, system so new is not run? available. So far, I can do everything I want it to do, but the new operating system is not available. Yeah, but that's my point. So, like, you're getting to the point where it's not compatible with all the new advances. Right. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I like the Air. I'm glad they brought it back. It's good. It's For me, it's a little bit too big, actually. I like the smaller ones, uh, but hmm. that's just the way it is. But, because um, I like extreme portability. I like it to be, like, if the MacBook was the size of the freaking iPad. I mean, it's crazy. Hmm. But I think I think most people, honestly, have just vision issues. I mean, I do too. I'm wearing glasses, but some people just they want a big screen. I don't want a big screen. I want it to be compact, solid, and just exactly what you need. But you know, everyone has their own thing. The problem is if you're in a niche market, like if you're a guy that's like only one percent of all people are like you, then they're just basically not going to cater to you. You know, they're going to cater to the to the big sales. Right, right. But I have and, a feeling half of your so wait, wait. So stop for a second. What's the name of your podcast? Tell me. Locofoco Netcast. Oh, Locofoco. Remember Locofoco? I, <laughs> I do. Do you do, do, do explain Locofoco at the beginning of every podcast so people understand what you're talking about, or do you just assume that they get it? Um, I have had a special episode dedicated to okay. Locofoco. Well, I understand, uh, but no, uh, okay, but when you listen to the podcast for the first time, do people know what Locofoco means? No. Okay. Is that on purpose, or just a lack of caring? La lassitude. Yeah, I mean, part of it is just simply, uh, part of it is just kind of a funny word. And there's plenty of podcasts with funny names, you know. So, it, so, so if they're puzzled by it, at some point they're going to run a, a run a run into the explanation. They could, of course, okay. go on Wikipedia. They could, of course, go on Wikipedia and say, "What is this Locofoco thing about?" And they'd find out right away. Uh, though I'm not sure Wikipedia is where I would go to find out about the Locofoco. 
but I did have a special podcast uh, with Anthony Comegna explaining the Locofoco. Anthony Comegna, who's now with uh, ISIL, <laughs> the Institute for Humane Studies. I know like that. ISIL. Are they still around? I was actually just. I, it's uh, not ISIL. Not it's not ISIL. Them, it's was... IHS. It's IHS. I'm pretty sure Institute for Humane Studies, and he has his own podcast called Ideas in Progress. So, okay. But he's a very good, he's a historian. He actually did his thesis on the Locofoco. And he had a very comprehensive thesis. He should make it into a book, but he hasn't done so yet. Did you hear yet, um, Tom Woods had an interview with uh, Pete Quinones. Do you know who he is? He's I the just, guy who was behind that, that video, that, that documentary. I've listened to the first three minutes of it, and then I had to put it down. I've not gone back to it yet. Yeah, give it a shot. It's it's. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, well, I've already heard the video, and uh, I mean, have you listened? Have you? You're aware of the documentary, right? I'm aware of the documentary, but have not seen it. Okay, yeah. So once you see it, then the interview is um, is interesting, but it's like it goes over things that you you would already know, and you and I already know because we're we're old timers in the movement, uh, whatever movement this is. Yes. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, well, I was, you know, a Liberty guy. You've been around here for a long time, contributing with uh, Hoppe and others and the Mises Institute. You have a, you still have a relationship with the Mises Institute? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I think most people from an outside observer status, like aliens landing on the Earth, looking at human relations, trying to figure things out, would probably say yes. Okay. I mean, it's not – I'm not like – well, first of all, things have changed since COVID, but um, uh, I'm not like one of the regular lecturers or get invited to things all the time. But I have good connections to a lot of the top people there, and I did get invited. I mean, to be honest, there was a bit of a falling out. Um, not really falling out, but things change over time. This is how it happens right. in – people that are – look, I don't like to say I'm a scholar or intellectual. I'm just a – I would say I'm a gentleman scholar, but I'm not even a gentleman. But, you know, just like – you know, there oh, are you're different an esquire. types of You're people. an esquire, St Stefan. True, 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 <laughs> true. I, I do have the esquire qualifications. Um, I'm, I'm a doctor. Um, no, the – I was more – closely aligned with them just by sort of inertia or what made sense to me for about 15 years. Um, let's say from 19... Do you want to talk about this or should I... Well, it, 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 do you want it on the podcast or not? That's that, that's that's a... I'm interested. I don't care. Dude, I'm I don't care. Well, I mean, you're friends with Jeffrey Tucker, right? I'm friends with lots of people. Friends with you and friends with lots of people. Um okay. Jeff and I started becoming closer friends as I started um, – you know, people know me as the IP guy, and you know, I don't mind that. I'm not like one of these bands that has a one-hit wonder, and they hate, they hate having to perform you know, 99 Luff Balloons over and over and over again because that's their only hit, but they have to do it because they have nothing else they can do. Um, I mean, I went into the IP field on purpose, but I mean in libertarian theory, and I'm happy about that, um, and it's been fruitful. But it's it was never like – you know, it, it never defined me, and I think most people – I don't think most people think that. I mean there are some people who don't know much, and they think, oh, Kinsella is the IP guy. That's it. But to me, it was always other things that interested me more, right? But rights theory and – Various aspects of libertarian legal theory, but I saw that there was a, a there was a need for someone to like tackle this issue, um, starting in the, the, the mid nineteen nineties because I couldn't figure it out, and I was smart, and I had read Rand and Rothbard and you know all the people, and everyone messed everything up, and I was thinking like, okay, I'll. I'm going to start practicing as, as, a, as a lawyer, and plus I'm libertarian writing. I, I'll Maybe I can help figure it out. And so I tried and tried and tried and tried, and 
I was actually it was like you know the atheist who's trying to find the better proof for God. I was trying to find okay. Rand's argument for IP makes no sense. Rothbard's argument for IP makes no sense. A, B, and C makes no sense. But we all know that it's legitimate, so <laughs> okay, I'll do it. I mean, how hard can it be? I mean, honestly, you don't have to be a Wittgenstein or a, I don't know who you consider to be your greatest. Who your, who who's your top three or four geniuses of all time? Would you say? And don't say Spencer. No, yeah, I don't know who Spencer. would be the. I don't know who would be the, and I, I don't really think of him. I don't think of the world like that. Um, yeah, I don't. You know, I, don't since, I don't either. I hate when people ask me that. I don't think of it that way either. Since my favorite writers are almost never the ones that people consider the great geniuses, like you just mentioned, one uh, in the 20th century philosophers. I mean, I like uh, George Santayana and Alexius Minon. Well, that ain't gonna get me any bennies with the with the in crowd. So, uh, and wait, so you, so uh, so you, Garrett Garrett, is that who you're referring to right now? No. You said one of your favorite writers. Who were you referring George to? George Santayana. But I do think Garrett Garrett is a great writer. Right. Oh, yeah, but earlier you had said that you really liked uh, a lot of the prose of a... I mean, so Santayana is like in Spanish? What's, what's his nope. language? No, his language is English. He was a he was a Spanish-American. He was His father was Spanish, but his mother was American, and he w was a Harvard uh, professor and then gave it up to write independently out there in the world. Moved to Europe and lived cheaply and uh, wrote books. Oh, okay. So you see, this is one of those cases where you just open my mind to something because, like, I get these ideas. Like, okay, there's a guy out there who's everyone says is great, like like Goethe or someone like that, you know. But unfortunately, I don't speak their language, and I don't I don't usually trust translations, especially for especially for things that are I won't say poetry, but they're they're they're, they're they're mired in the manipulation of the language, right? Like, right. I mean, I'll read it on occasion. Like, if it's a novel, there's a plot you can translate, but uh, some prose, right? Some feelings, some things. I I can always see. I'll never, I'll never see it if I don't speak that language. And so I always assume Santayana was a. Uh, yeah, I've never read him. I mean, I've read about him, but yeah, I thought he was Spanish or Portuguese or something. Well, his background well, is that's Spanish. That's how ignorant I am. But that's it's just he's just an American American expatriate writer basically. He left fairly I didn't early. Know that. So he wrote he wrote in English like yeah, that was and, his natural language. And beautifully in English. Probably the best prose stylist of 20th century philosophy. Well, I was going to ask you which Gary Gary you recommend because I've never been impressed by him either, but um I haven't tried it too much. But if uh, yeah, if uh, if you want to, if you want to recommend a couple of things, I would love to have like a couple of things to dig into, like Santayana or whatever. Yeah, well, Santayana is. Uh, how shall I put this? Santayana. I don't know where to t tell a person to go for Santayana because everybody has their different interests, right? Um, I think that you should try reading his essay, "The Unknowable," which is, alas, mm. a his Herbert Spencer Memorial Lecture. Uh, and it mm. begins with a discussion <laughs> of Spencer, but it is also a beautiful piece of writing. And then he does something amazing in metaphysics. Uh, I knew you were bringing Spencer in. I, I knew it. I told you. I predicted this. Well, of course. Yeah. I mean, Spencer is a, this weird touchstone I have. Just like, for you know, I would normally have probably somebody like Ludwig von Mises uh, or Menger. Menger is my other touchstone. Really, Menger and, and, and Spencer are probably the two most important social thinkers for me that, that I keep on coming back to. What do you think about Bamba Verk? Absolute genius. And his book on capital and interest, his, the, the history of capital and interest theories, may be one of the greatest books ever written. Have you read his, uh, the four, what's it called, Four Shorter Classics or whatever? Which to me has like this amazing essay right on you froze uh oh we have a froze we have a freeze in this but we we just froze uh Stefan Are we back? Yeah, I think we're back. 
I don't know. So you were talking about uh, some of the shorter essays by Bemberberg. That's where we that's where we froze on. And uh, I think it's you, a book. Yeah, it's a book. I think it's a book called Shorter Essays or something. It's like four yes. essays, and one of them is on legal legal relationships and how they relate to economics. Right. And it's brilliant, right? I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's uh, it's before its time in a sense. I don't know if if you could. I mean, what's one interesting thing about this? I mean, you're used to this because this is what you like. These you read these older guys, and you have to give them. You have to give them a break, right? Like, okay, they're not speaking our language exactly, and they don't have footnotes from a 2009 Stephen Pinker article or whatever because <laughs> it was you know 120 years ago or whatever. So you got to give them a break. You have to read it with a little bit of – I don't say charity might be the right word, but you have to like – well, you'll see if you listen to this Tom Woods interview with Pete Quinones, like where they're talking about how they incorporated some of the left libertarian anarchists into the documentary, and Tom was complimenting Pete on being really uh, fair – to the left libertarian anarchists, and he, his point was, I'm not sure if the, the reverse would have been the case. In other words, if this had been a left libertarian documentary about Emma Goldman and all these guys, like if they had even d decided to mention the right libertarian guys, the right anarchist precursors, I don't know if they'd be as fair to them as we were to them. That was an interesting point. I don't know. I don't know if the, what the truth is, but… I could see his – I think he might be roughly right, roughly right. That's a sad thing about left and right these days, and that seems to be endemic on the left is their, their insularity and their just bad manners. Yeah, and of course I think that's true more among the, the activists and the uh, – these, these people are not – they're not like really intellectuals. I mean – I mean, you'll get the occasional left libertarian who will be proposing, you know, basic guaranteed income or something. And my thinking is they're usually either they're low level thinkers in terms of they're just not that impressive scholars or you know, or they're unfair. But I don't know. I mean, it's just it's probably just the way it is. I mean, we have all of us have in a way slim pickings like uh the people that we choose to be our our thinkers, our avatars nowadays. I mean, I do think. I mean, what do you think about this? Let me ask you this question. Slightly change the subject, but like, say in the because you're you've been around the libertarian movement. How long have you? How long have you been a libertarian? Would you say since 1980? 1980. What happened in 80? Well, one thing was the Clark campaign. And that did actually okay. get me to meet libertarians for the first time. I had read Robert Nozick prior to that, and I had and I had read Ernst van den Haag's uh, absolute devastating article against libertarians in National Review, and then in the Inquiry, the defense of themselves by you know David Friedman and Marie Rothbard and others uh, defended them oh, against them. Yeah, this is vaguely called. Oh, so remind me, I. I like I feel like I'm a newbie here because I'm not really familiar with the the Van den Hog uh, National Review criticism of libertarians. He basically called libertarians lunatics. They're extreme extremist lunatics. They're not conservative. They are radicals. They might as well be socialists. They're awful. You've got to be fucking kidding me. That's basically the idea that he was getting across. Uh, it was very nasty and very funny, uh, but you know. It was not the high point of Libertarian National Review uh, uh, relations. So I guess we're back. I think we're back. Yeah, I, I heard you a little bit. Yeah, but keep saying poor connection. 
You ever notice that when people talk and they have a poor connection, they always blame the other guys? Like, I don't know what's going on in Seattle, but, I mean, or Portland or whatever. Right, right. And I don't know what's going on. I, I actually have a VPN going right now. Uh, I probably, usually that makes the thing better, but maybe I should uh, take the VPN off. Which which country are you going through? Well, it's going through Seattle, probably. Uh, and then... And then <laughs> oh, you didn't... You didn't choose like Singapore or something. Well, it often gives me. Uh, it has some sort of phantom in Italy that I often hit. Often hit. Well, I think I'm not on VPN, but um, I didn't so even think about it. On you. Oh, I wonder what would happen if I turned it off right now. Do you have any idea? I'm gonna try. I it. think Skype would adapt because they should try to. And you froze, but now you're back. Very good. It worked pretty well. Sorry. We'll see if this I'm is better. I'm rambling all over the place. Sorry. Yeah, well, we're uh, not really... The uh, subject that I chose for us uh, today is not going to be addressed, obviously. We're just having a chat. I think it's what's happening. What was, our, what was our subject? What was it supposed to be? Well, I was asking, going to ask you about legal positivism. But let's uh, let's carry on with our discussion of, uh, of uh, the, the deep history of our uh, libertarian connections. Uh, you were asking about Ernst von den Haag, uh, and that's where we were last in our conversation. Well, what I was going to ask you was um, if you agree that it, by some strange um, – so I think the libertarian movement – well, let's look at it as an overview. The libertarian movement, I would say, started – in the 50s and 60s, right? That's what I think. Now, there are precursors, no doubt. Um, but I think that basically it was Ayn Rand, Leonard Reed, Milton Friedman, and then Rothbard, to some degree, Hayek and Mises. But I think that me, the, the, liber, the modern libertarian movement is an American thing that came out of certain thinkers and their popularity and their message in the in the in the in the sixties and seventies. I mean roughly. I mean would you agree with that? Like that is the modern libertarian of... movement, right. Um Brian Doherty likes to mention the three furies of libertarianism, uh, the, the three women yeah. Isabel Patterson, yeah. Rose Wilder Lane, and Ayn Rand. Um and they make a lot of sense. Um but see, I'm what am I? I'm forty years. I came in forty years after that period, or three five years after the, the, those three women did their thing, and twenty years after the efflorescence of the Samizdat aspect of the libertarian movement, which Brian Doherty did not talk about very much. Uh, there were a number of libertarian zines, as we might say, in the early late fifties, right. early sixties, uh, that are not known and are not really his, uh, talk, talked about historically, but they were very important, I think, to to help the the movement, as it were. And uh, certainly they fed into YAF. That's kind of some, YAF got a lot of their a lot of their impetus from the yep. Samas dot era. Um, yeah, and but of I'm, course uh, that 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 book by uh, Jerome Tichilli, um it usually begins with Ayn Rand. I mean, I'm sure you've read it. And laughed all me, the way through. <laughs> to me, it's an amazing book, and it's it's probably. A book of its time, and it was the perspective of one guy, uh, who I'm not even sure was libertarian to be honest. Uh, but it was a good journalistic sort of humorous, intelligent look at this burgeoning sort of set of ideas, right? Yes. Um, now, but what it seems to me is this: is that if I take like my place in this movement, like not my place, but like my when I came into it, like in the in the mid '80s, it was growing already. You know, it already had a place with the the earlier campaign you were talking about, um, and the Libertarian Party, and the Mises Institute, and the you know this weird cult around Ayn Rand and her whole thing, right? 
And then things like Liberty Magazine and Reason Magazine, right? I think all that is basically part of the story. Um, but – and it seems to me that Ron Paul, his movement, which I was never into to be honest, but I can see why that would have attracted a huge new number of college students and activists and whatever. So I, I feel like our numbers started getting at bigger. Hold on. I feel like our numbers started getting bigger, like in the in the eighties. Um, I'm sorry, in the nineties. Hold on. I don't hear you right now. Yeah, no, I'm back now. Okay, back. let me get back into my position here in my, in my seat. I'm almost glued to it by now. Um, yeah. The cool thing about this, uh, can you hear me? Barely. Oh, hold on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, if you, there's something with your headset. Uh, it's very low. Can you hear me? Hold on. Yes, I can. Okay. I switched. Sorry. I switched to my AirPods because I don't know uh, what happened. Uh, I like the sound better. Well, uh, I've been fighting this using this because it can't be better, but it it seems to be. I mean, I bought these crazy Jabra headphones, which have noise cancellation, but they're just uh, – they're nothing good. I go crazy over audio, by the way. I'm not a technophile like you are, but, and I don't know how to do it. And I'm not, I, if I had a professional thing where this was my job, I would figure it out. But I, I can't get a good connection. Um, and the best always is the stupid. So you're like on, a, oh, so you're using the Apple uh, earbuds for monitoring only. I got it. These are just, these are just, mon yeah, these are just headphones. Uh, they look yeah, better. I mean, so I, have, I have professional headphones right here, but they look stupid on my head. You know, I mean, they're just they're... no, but I mean, you can hear that, but your voice is going through the microphone anyway. Oh, I have two microphones Sorry. up set up to a set up to a Scarlett Focusrite uh system, and uh, it's going through you know fairly professional equipment. Well, the thing is, I've got two or three of these things I've got the snowball mic, I've got the uh, and I can never get them to like they're always too low. So I need a professional going to help me. But anyway, sorry. What were we talking about? Now I've well, gotten distracted. Well, you were talking something about uh, the libertarian movement seemed to be growing in the 90s. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We yeah. came in in the 80s. You and I both are kind of in the same generation, just a little bit of a lag. But the, the well, 90s didn't start happening. If, well, I was going to ask you if you agree that like – so my impression is that the movement has gotten bigger in the sense of more people and more prominence. People – I find that the mainstream media, cable news companies, whatever, they don't misuse the word libertarian as much as they used to. Like they used to always call the conservative Cato Institute. You know what I mean? Like they yes. always did that. They, they still do it from time to time, but it seems like there's a, an increasing awareness of what libertarians are. So from the media point of view and from the – Mainstream point of view, I think that people know what libertarians are. Right. Um, but – and I also feel like the – okay, in a sense, the – so I think most of the people we've drawn in have been activists, right? Hold on. I'm sorry, I'm going to quiet mode. Uh, they've been activists. Now, activists are not always the most intellectual or scholarly or academic of people. 
Um, on the other hand, libertarians have gotten more radical. Like they want to abolish the Fed now. You know, they want to do A, B, and C. They're not all anarchists, but so I feel like in in some sense that there's more libertarians now, and their quality is higher. However, there's something about these libertarians in the 60s and 70s and 80s, mostly the Randians, to be honest. Like they had this sort of hyper um, respect for uh, scholarship. And most libertarians you would meet, at least the ones I would meet and probably the ones you would meet, like at these gatherings that we would do. They would be the type that, that are the intellectual ones. Like they've read the Reason magazine articles, they've read the Liberty articles, they've read the journals. They they knew about the, the three or four journals we had at the time, right? right. The Jeffrey what was it, Jeffrey Friedman when I, I keep forgetting the name, uh, the one Jeffrey Friedman edited forever. Um, there's Reason papers, there's Liberty, uh, you know, there's just this material, and it was just like there wasn't a lot of it. And so you could basically absorb it all if you were a complete – but now I'm thinking like, no, that was just me as an idiot, you know, sophomore, junior in college going to the library and reading everything because I was a dork. I don't think everyone's like that, though, which is fine, right? You know what I mean? Right. So my, my view is that the libertarian movement is bigger now, but it's stupider. And and not only stupider, but in terms of less intellectual and more activist and more Ron Paulian, but like less aware of the entire history of our movement. They haven't read, you know, everyone I would bump into like at a at a thing in nineteen ninety two. They've read Ethics of Liberty by Rothbard, for example. Exactly. Some of them some of them might have read Nozick. But now you meet people, they don't even know what you're talking about, right? And it's not like they've moved on to the new guys. They just haven't read anything. Like they'll read pamphlets. Like so now the thing is pamphlets. Now, some of them are disguised as books, but they're basically pamphlets, right? And that's fine. That's how ideas get procreated. They, the guys that uh, understand them, they want to have their own little brand. But, I mean, you probably come across three, four, five, ten libertarian books, which are more or less right, and they're impressive, but they're just regurgitations in a simplistic way of what was figured out before, and I don't even think anyone even reads those. <laughs> so it's it's a weird thing that's happened. But anyway, that's just my – uh, my venting on that issue. What, what do you think about it? Well, we're in the age of uh, podcasts, and people get their information from podcasts. And if they want to be intellectual, they go to Quora. Um, which what? is certain. I know that's that that's a, a joke? that's a joke. That's a joke. But if they want me, you're going to go to Quora. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting situation with. Uh, just a different intellectual landscape and but i wonder if to what extent it's true your painting of the older picture because when i got into the first libertarian group i got involved with in 1980 within two months they were telling people new people to come to me to explain everything um so obviously the right. old hands had not read all that much right you could be right um but they were I aware mean, of them. They were aware of them. Well, I, so I guess what I'm trying to say is my impression of the old guys was that they were more – they were way more respectable and statist. Like they were way more menarchists and Randians, right? But they were actually more into like delving into ideas. On the other hand – one reason they could do that was because there wasn't as much material to read. I mean, you could read the entire 
I mean, did you ever have, I assume you use Leslie Fair Books catalog. I don't know if you ever had a relationship with them, but that was the thing back then, right? Exactly. Now it's the internet, but it used to be, and now it's, the, it's YouTube and the internet, but it used to be an Amazon, right? Uh, and podcast. Everything has changed. It's crazy how much has changed. But Leslie Fair Books used to be the thing. And I just, it just seems like weird to me that like young guys don't even know this. I don't know if they should know it or if they need to know it, but like, and Brian Darty's book, I guess, is a good, you know, thing that you could read to like get some. I mean, maybe it needs to be like a course, like how to be a new libertarian. <laughs> I don't realize <laughs> like the last 40 years of what you're missing or something. And w without hearing people say in my day, you know, this is how we did it, you know. Right. But I have a sort of a different perspective, I think, um, because though the libertarian movement began, as you say, I had, I go back 100 years earlier, because to me, there were two libertarian movements as movements before then, before our time. Okay. There was okay. the Loco Foco movement, which was basically as, as libertarian as you can get if, in, a, in a political movement in America. There's never been a more libertarian group that was successful in any possible way than the Locofocos in the Democratic okay. Party in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. And they had some influence. Uh, and you read Leggett, so you know that he's fairly sound. Mm -hmm. um, and wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. Not only was he a sound, Leggett was one of the first guys who was really good on intellectual property. Which is amazing for his time because all these guys are totally confused by the labor theory of property and labor theory of value, I think, or most of them. Right. Like That's there's the almost was... no one good on this issue, but Leggett was like incredible. Right, right. He's, he's, Didn't he's he a hero. Did he like die early or something or like yes, he, he died at like 43 or something? Or He was a very sick man. He was never very – he's one of those people that uh, would have – in an uncivilized situation, would have died young. But then, so am I. Uh, <laughs> we just have a better civilization now, as far as, far as health is concerned. But uh, he he died he died young. Um, now, but there was another one. The individualists in Great Britain, especially, there was an actual movement there. Uh, I was just got in the mail Wordsworth Donisthorpe's Law in a Free State, uh, which is a you know a book he wrote in the late 18, 1800s. And he begins his preface talking about intellectual history and the history of individualists. He says, when he was, you know, in the old days, just talking, just like we were right now, in the old days, he could count all the individualists in Britain. They'd all fit into one room. But right. now there are thousands and thousands of them. Mm. And, and he said, and it's largely due to Herbert Spencer. He agreed that it was largely due to Herbert Spencer. Uh, so self-conscious, and but also to the activist movements in Britain at that time. The Law and Property League, I think, is one of them, or something like that. Uh, Liberty and Property League, one of those. And, the, and there, there was a few legal rights association, individual, I, don't, I forget the names of their organizations. But they were important. They were activist organizations. All that was killed by World War I. There was nothing that survived World War I. Well, don't, I mean, yeah. All right. I'm with you. I'm with you. And so what I did when I entered the libertarian movement was not only read the recent stuff, but also went back and, you know, right to the hundred year the century before, because there was obviously something going on there. I read Gustav de Molinari before I read most of the anarcho-capitalist stuff. The exception, well, being, the exception being David Friedman. Mm. What are your thoughts on him? Molinari is one of those many very genius re writers who is not translated in English very much. So you and I. Oh, don't I mean, have... what do you think about Friedman? <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> I was curious what you thought about Friedman. David Friedman. Uh, he's a real smart cookie. That's what I would say about uh, David Friedman. Uh, I've interacted with him a few times uh, because you know he was an editor at Liberty and we had some Liberty conferences. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's a very interesting fellow. Um, we we tangle every now and then. He uh, he tangles on my blog. He doesn't like something I write on my blog, and he any any uh, any uh, you know comments, and uh, and I respond, and you know, that's that's cool. Uh, 
but I don't follow them. We're not social friends. You know, we're not even on Facebook friends. I don't think we're Facebook friends. Uh, so, you know, there's that. Yeah, I find I find him. Uh, yeah, he's a genius. He's he was one of my big inspirations with his machinery of freedom. Um, but I met the guy at Liberty Libertopia in California maybe ten years ago, which I was glad to do. But he just he just was repeating this stuff about von Neumann showed you can have interpersonal cardinal comparisons of utility. It's like he just will never let this Chicago thing go, you know, which I think is just ridiculous. But yeah, that's probably I mean, um, the, yeah. I just say they just they just don't want I mean they just don't want to all their theories are based upon this utilitarianism right like and if you shoot holes in it then you ruin their life work you know I mean so, so, let's say he's right that von Neumann who with a who are, von Neumann showed that you can have what an equation a way to like sum up cardinal utilities and then and then people come up with these examples like oh the austrians are wrong in their subjective theory preference because when you give a birthday present to your brother-in-law you have a feeling for what he likes i mean come on come on we all know that this entire attack on subjective utility value theory is because these guys want to have an official approval of their government plans. I mean, this is what it is. It's 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 not funny. It's not a joke. It's not safe. It's dangerous. Um so 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 what if you show that von Neumann showed that there's a way to comp- this is like these guys that opposed Mises in the 1920s when Mises showed that socialism can't rationally, economically calculate. And their answer was, well, you could have a supercomputer that could do it. That was their answer. Like, OK, fine. Let the Soviet Union, let Kim Jong-un come up with a supercomputer that's going to rationally plan their, their glorious future. It's ridiculous. It's all ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Even if it's on theory possible, it's not going to happen. We know that. Which is sort of why, honestly, I sometimes tend towards uh, public choice economics because I tend to think the reason we have a state is because it's inevitable because of the the way human interactions work, right? Like, in other words, at least at this point in our in our history. In our human society, you're going to have a state emerge because some people will start pushing for this and that, and other people don't have an interest in fighting it, and so it will just emerge, right? So it's public choice economics. Um, doesn't mean it's justified. It just means that's an explanation of why it emerges. Right, and um, you know Molinari did, worked on this somewhat too. This is it was like an interesting subject to him because he came up with this idea that we could do better than this. That, you know, that's kind of really what what the anarcho-capitalist idea is, and that's what Molinari was talking about: is we can do better than dealing with this kludge factory that is the state, because the state always tempts us to do horrible things. That's one of the things about the st- that state is always doing is tempting us to do horrible things, and. Uh, but there's a reason we keep on going to the state, and one of them is probably because we're, you know, we're apes. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's that's actually kind of my view. I think that we came out of the trees too soon. We're apes. Yeah, I agree. And so then the question is, well, there's two questions. Number one is, if the state is inevitable, does that have a moral implication, right? I don't think it does because I think that crime is inevitable too, but we can always oppose crime. So I, I, I don't really think there's a, a lot of thing there. But then the question is if it's inevitable, is it always inevitable or just is this a temporary period? So I hate to be like Marxian, but you know, I think maybe Marx was basically right. Like 
maybe there's phases of society that have to happen. And then now I don't agree with his final result, but I don't know. Maybe I do. Maybe in the end we have a not communist, but we have a post scarcity society where we're so wealthy that everything is trivial, right? I mean, is that really not the Marxian dream in a sense? Well, you know, that is a form of current communist thought is that really what it comes down to it. Uh, you, Sargon of Akkad has even brought this up, which is kind of amusing to see it done on the, in, in the uh, YouTube sphere. But that is uh, the idea that uh, perhaps someday things will be so plentiful that the slave class, the, the class that we exploit, is the machine class, the class of machinery. And that's very close to Marx's conception of the means of production. Uh, but I'm not really into Marx like that because I think he missed something really, some really important things, and that's why I prefer Spencer because Spencer also had the idea of stages of, of of stages of society, different kinds of complexity, and he thought with industrialism came new challenges and new potentialities, and liberty was possible at that point. After the military, the militant kinds of societies. Uh, that where civilization pretty much started with. You know, one of the things, one of my, uh, you know, as, as as you probably occasionally see in various Facebook and on our discussion groups, I bring up the great old megalith structures. I'm fascinated by really ancient history, uh, mainly because there's so much we don't know. Mm -hmm. And they engaged in mass production, to an extent that we still can't duplicate, which is kind of interesting. We, you know, we say that you know socialism is impossible because the consum we can't meet the consumer demands because there's no coordination and and it's just there's no calculation. There's no way that socialism can that a big state can do what capitalism can for the people. That's just not possible. But the ancient states produced things, if they were states, produced things that we cannot right now duplicate. If we tried to build the Great Pyramid, we would fail. Mm. We can't even move the blocks. Oh, oh, I see where you're going. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so A aliens. No, I'm not saying that. No, actually, I'm not saying that. What I, we, I, I, I think we lost some knowledge. I think that there's some knowledge that's been lost. I don't know what that knowledge is. And since I don't know what it is, I can't say what, what it is. What I am saying is that Mises described capitalism as mass production for the masses. But in ancient times, they had mass production for the elites. They had mass production for a few big projects. And I think one of the big issues that people have is that we have difficulty making a distinction between big projects and capitalism. Big pro you know, we, obviously the pyramids can be made, so obviously we can have a social society. Obviously, uh, you know, we can, the government can make a bridge, so obviously we need the government to make a bridge. Those things don't line up. That isn't quite how the world works. And capitalism offers some, you know, a, a, a new kind of order can do things that are more amazing. And we don't need the government for, the, for those things. And I think that's a huge challenge. And I think that we still have to deal with the fact that maybe they can actually do something politically. Maybe that this new form of organization, which isn't how the pharaohs did it, maybe this new form of organization can to do everything that we want it to do. But we're, but human beings are afraid because we, frankly, kind of like the pharaohs. Everybody wants to worship a pharaoh. Mm. I mean, I don't, you don't, but there is a huge class of people out there that cannot imagine a non-hierarchical society. And even the egalitarians can't imagine it because mm. they immediately set up hierarchies. I mean, the, the ridiculous part of everything was recently shown in Seattle at, with Chaz. They kick out the police and they set up their own police force. Yeah. <laughs> it's a gang, yeah. but still. <laughs> uh, yep, I have nothing to add to that. I, I, I think that's probably right, <laughs> to be honest. But that leaves us where we were at the beginning, is that we know that we have a new idea and that it can have really important effects on society. And we know it works. 
but we don't know how far it can go. We should test how far it can go. We're certainly going in the wrong direction if we're going back to the pharaohs. Nevertheless, that shouldn't let us demean what the pharaohs did, right? I would, <laughs> I would tentatively agree with that. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. That's a big statement, but I think so. Yeah. So well, it's I, not just with the pharaohs. So the pharaohs, to me, the pharaohs is a stand-in, right? So the pharaohs are a stand-in for. Um, for what humanity has accomplished in the last, what, 10,000 years? 6,000 um, 6, for our civilization, 5,000 for our civilization? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking evolution has happened longer than that, but basically over time, gradually, humans have developed society and have developed what I would call recipes or knowledge, right? Which we've built on and built on and built on. Sometimes lost, sometimes went backwards. But the knowledge that we develop as humans and that we accumulate as part of our cultural capital or whatever you want to call it, this is, I actually think this is the, the explanation of our modern uh, success. Is because we have so much knowledge about the world now, which we've gradually stumbled upon, right, over time. So, yeah, I mean, in a way, you have to say that, Jesus Christ, all of our ancestors from 100, 300, 500, 1,000 years before, they lived horrible, horrible, horrible lives. And they kept struggling and gave us the information that we all use today. And I think, I mean, I won't say a little bit of gratitude is owed because they're, they're gone, but you know what I mean? It's like appreciate where the information came from. Yeah. Um, our ancestors gave this to us, and, and, and if things keep going well… I don't know if it will, but if in a thousand years our progeny are basically immortal space gods, it's because of what we did and their ancestors and our ancestors. And you know, maybe if my son my son's grandchild is a god someday, maybe he'll recognize that he owes it a little bit to his great grandfather. You know what I mean? Yeah. But but that's the sci-fi nerd in me. That's the Dune nerd in me. I mean, you know, I don't know. That's my only hope for humanity, to be honest, is just okay. exponential growth. Right. Um, that was sort of my that was my kind of vision of the world until fairly recently when I realized that there are cyclical catastrophes that are astounding. Um when I realized what the end of the Ice Age was like and how it changed the world, I'm still reeling from the information about that. So, uh, Where, Where'd you get that from? Tell, well, tell all over the place. That. All over the place. They're learning about it now. I mean, they're discovering, they're discovering the information about how the ice caps melted so fast. And uh, but a lot of it's outside of the academic world because the academy is like, well, the, it's like climate science. The academy is basically run by people, the same kind of people who uh, believe climate science is settled, which climate science is in its, its infancy. They don't know diddly squat. They will build models, you know, like von Neumann, uh, and that don't pan out, but they're very confident and they use their models to try to get us to do things politically. That's like, that's a lot of ancient history, but in the next few years, we're going to be seeing a lot of information filter even into the academy and even into the mainstream understanding of what happened 13,000, 12,000 years ago. It's not that long of a time ago, but we had a an extinction level event at that time. Human beings somehow survived. Right. And I don't know what life was like before that, but it could have been very different than we think. Because this, you know, the sea levels rose by 400 feet. And we don't know it's buried 400 feet at the at, at, at the old ocean's edge. 
Um, so I don't know what life was like back then. Uh, there's, we're learning all sorts of things all the time, like about the Denisovans. 20 years ago, we didn't know that there was another species of human being on the planet. Now we do, and we know that they had a huge influence in some weird way that we don't know exactly what that is. Uh, but it's uh, an astounding thing that we're, what they're learning. Um, so they may have given a civilization. Denisovans may be responsible for the this the, the, the real uh, uh, impetus for uh, for civilization. I don't know if that's true. Once again, I don't know, but it's very interesting to to look at this look at the past. And I guess I'm more interested in the past these days in part because. I don't know. I can't know the future, but we can learn more about the past. Past, and uh, and we're going to learn the future as it comes every day. But that's about it. Uh, so I can make my prognostications, but I, they're you know they're worth most progn prognostications. You know, I'm not a great prophet. Though I bet you've had prophecies in the past that have panned out. I bet you've made bets about the future in the past that panned out. Can you think of any? That's a good question because I honestly think I'm a pretty, pretty bad of, like, I don't know, the last three, four, five, seven president elections. I think I've, I got it wrong. Like I thought, you know, I thought Kerry would be win. You know, I thought Jimmy Carter would lose. <laughs> I mean, I was a seventh grader at the time or whatever, but mm -hmm. like right now, I think that Trump will lose, but he won last time. So it's crazy. And plus, I do believe that that I think the elections will be totally uh, mucked up this time by the coronavirus. So you could have, for example, um, turnout that's like way below historical levels right because people just don't want to wait in line for five hours right i'm not gonna i mean i never vote anyway but i'm not gonna wait in line for five hours to vote so right. a lot of people won't so does that affect the election this way or that way it's hard to it's hard to predict so um I'm I'm not a good prognosticator. Um, I do so. My program here's my prognostications. Um, I think that the internet and copying and torrenting and encryption and cell phones and video cameras and all this kind of stuff they've kind of combined to deal a big, big, big blow to copyright law, right? Because people can just you can have copyright law, which says you can't copy things, but people can copy things. So the internet has basically dealt a death blow to copyright, I think. And we'll see that play out in the next decade or two, I think. Um, I have a feeling that something like that is coming with 3D printing and related technologies uh, for the patent system because – if you can just print and make an object, a physical object that serves a useful purpose to do whatever you want. Now, right now, it's all these little plastic things that are just like grommets or you know washers or spacers or trivial things. They're, they're all primitive. But if you remember <laughs> – yeah, and you're, I think, older than me. If you, you remember how dot matrix printers at the beginning, very primitive, but – they were like a revolution, right? And then you had dot matrix and laser printers, and they were expensive at first. And they kept going, and now you could you could print a book easily if you wanted to. Like you could buy a machine that would print a book, right? Um, or just do it from Amazon or whatever. I mean, it's it's not that hard, right? Now, I think that three D is is still another level of complexity, but I. Of course, it's going to improve. So over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, who, who can imagine what in, in 40 or 50 years can be produced from a 3D printer? Um, and it's going to be a lot. And that will under undermine the whole patent system, I think. Right? So 
because you can't stop what people do in their basements or in the public library down the street and they get you know so to me that's two good things like so, sort of like uber undermined the taxi cab monopoly i do believe that technology will help undermine at least that and not just that other things too I mean, the drug war is going to end. I think we all know that. Right? Gay marriage is already here. I mean, uh, the drug war is on, on its ropes. Right? Right. So, all these things the state does are like gradually getting attacked by knowledge. And honestly, I think it's social media and the internet because people see what the government's doing, right? And so uh, there's scrutiny, right? I mean, you have people, police police are apparently quitting the police department right now because they're like, ah, I don't want to be, you know, call the bad guy. So these things have effects. So I have some slight optimism. I mean, I I don't know if I have short term optimism, medium term, or long term, but uh, I'm trying to have medium term optimism. Put it that way. That's my view. I get the. I think I'm in your page on that one. Short term, I'm not very optimistic. I think there's we're going to be going through some real crises very quickly. Uh, yeah. Mainly, the left is going is going crazy, and when when you have a third of the population at ramped up to 11 and also lunatic they don't have their ideas they're, they're incoherent their demands are insane and nearly everything about them is nuts so that's going to have some problems and how we well, deal with it's, it's not it's, it's not just that it's also the, the the mounting federal debt and you know i mean like three trillion here three trillion there at a certain point it becomes a lot of money right yeah, I mean, no, that's 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 the looming crisis. In fact, one of my theses for a long time has been that one of the reasons we are going crazy is because everybody knows there's something wrong, deep, deep, deep. Yeah, I think, and I think this is something that everybody really understands, but they don't want to. They officially they deny, deny, deny. I mean, everybody denies that the yeah. debt makes any difference, right? Paul Krugman says it's a great thing, so it must be a great thing, right? Um, it's a very interesting time we're living in, and so it'll be fun to see how it goes. Uh, as far as 3D printing, and that's where it gets really interesting. Here's a technical Austrian economics thing. Okay, th- th- this, I'm curious about this because I just def- used uh, Mises' definition of capitalism as mass production for the masses. 3D printing isn't mass production for the masses. It's individual production for the individuals. It's family right. production for the family. And it's a reversion, but on another right. ramped up level. So what is that going to do yep. for the free order uh, Garrett Garrett would say it's wonderful because he believes that's when that's when freedom is possible is when we have uh, uh, is when we can basically create things out of uh, almost ex nihilo when you can freely transform stuff that's one of his theses in one of his books I forget which one uh, the worm our Oberus, I believe is, is a booklet that he did a long time ago and that's uh, or it's just called a Roborus, I believe and uh, his idea is that basically that's when we become free is that when we no longer are dependent upon the networks of people that states can capture when capitalism is capturable that's 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 the interesting thing about about markets is that capital is capturable by states well this is okay so i mean think about our word libertarian i mean the root word is liberty right and we talk about freedom and so that is the the guiding mode of a lot of people, freedom, liberty, and that leads into the leftist anti hierarchy thing. Like, oh, well, if I have, if I'm supposed to have freedom or liberty, then if my employer or my social connections or my church puts too many controls on me, then I don't have freedom anymore, right? So it's this focus on freedom. Right. Um, I just wonder if that's like a misplaced. Yeah. Like maybe our word is wrong. Right. We shouldn't. It's it's not liberty. It's it's prosperity and cooperation. 
right? And so what does that require? That requires property rights, property rules, et cetera. Um, so it's, I just think it's hard to predict what's going to happen. I mean, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm ranting here. Well, uh, getting the Kinsella rant is, of course, why we're here. Yeah, I know. That's that's that that's your goal, right? I'm joking, but I mean, yeah, yeah. Some of the Kinsella rants are classic, but they're they don't they don't hold up through time. But uh, I mean, I I have this goal that we can gradually, as a human race increase prosperity and cooperation and tolerance and diversity and all these things that I think are good things. Um, it's just, I think we might have some hard times to go through to get there. Um, to me, it's just it's a question of a race between the underlying free market technological effects which are the good things on one hand, um, and the oppressing factors on the other, which are always, I won't say always going to be there, but they're going to be there for quite a while, right? Um, but as you were saying, um, the trajectory, the, tra the trend line for that kind of, that, that sector of the society has a real bad element to it it's not solvent all of the uh, almost all of the welfare states of the western world almost everything every place is insolvent they've completely leveraged everything and it doesn't really make any sense so i think there's going to be right. that's the real next big reckoning and how we handle that will determine much of the future well, and, and think about it in like historical terms. I mean, in a way, we have a, a version of this in the U.S. with this reparations movement. Like, like so, people are still talking about maybe we should have a reparations movement for slavery. So we're talking like a hundred plus years old claims. And by the way, those aren't the only claims. So you have Japanese Americans who were ki kidnapped and imprisoned. You have Native Americans who were still to this day on reservations i mean if you open this can of worms there's no end to when you satisfy everyone's final claims and there's no one to satisfy the claims by the way i mean the wealth has been this this is what most people don't understand they think that i think most people that think in these terms have a fixed total sum view of wealth like, you know, they think that, oh, there's $17 trillion in the world, and that's just all there is. So someone has to have it, and we can shift it around. But that's not how the world works, right? Right. I mean, wealth increases all the time. We need, we need it to increase all the time. And there's wealth that's been destroyed because of – bad policies in the past and so there's no one left who can you know it's i mean to take a simple example you know if you if you murder someone let's say you owe their family 10 million dollars or 3 million dollars or whatever it is yeah but most people that murder people are not the types of people that have 3 million dollars this is why we oppose aggression is because it destroys wealth, and there's there's no way to get it back. I'm not saying you can't do justice. In some cases, you could say, "Listen, the just thing to do would be to do this," but you'll never you'll never make that family whole. You'll never make that guy whole. You'll never bring back his life or what you did wrong. And I think the justice system, the legal system, has to recognize this, right? But anyway, this is Kinsella, uh, just like I will say, despairing, but being realistic.
Well, certainly we can't remake the past. It's a very utopian idea that we need to make everybody whole for every crime ever committed, or in the case of reparations to African American African Americans, to make descendants of people whole for crimes were committed by other people to other people. I mean, this is we're we're, we're talking here is that that's that's all very utopian and it's uh, and kind of dumb. I mean, the, the big problem with uh, reparations is that so basically, African Americans demand more welfare. That's what's destroyed them now, and they want more of it. Uh, I mean, to me, that's the the biggest argument against reparations is that it'll do more harm than good. Oh, I they, totally agree. They got to get over it, but the people who don't want them to get over it are the race hustlers. I mean, Al Sharpton and all the other Al Sharptons out there, many of them in the media, they really live off of having this utopian idea of re uh, of rectifying the past. Well, there's no real rectifying the past, as you were saying. Certainly, if somebody's well, been killed, you can't get the killed person back, and that's their ultimate rec uh, that's the ultimate rectification. That's you know, it's restitution, and everything else is just some compensation that pre prevents a dis disincentive for future bad things. Well, but if you have rectification, I mean, you could see rectification being done in a particular case by the person who did the crime. They make amends, they make apologies, they try to do what they can. They want to get integrated back into society and accepted, you know, okay, uh, I've made my amends. But yeah, you the whole idea in a collective sense is is total nonsense. But the point is I think we all know that, like, so I, I think there's, I don't think there's a coming race war exactly because most people don't want to do that. And most people are not like that. But if you force most people to say, take a stand, who you're going to side with, they're going to side with their own people. Right? It's like, just let it go, man. I mean, because it will never be enough. Because we can, it will never be enough because we we don't we can't give enough. Like the wrongs, and it's not just we. It's like, well, exactly. Like my ancestors didn't come here until nineteen hundred. So why are they? Re why am I responsible for you know? Like they are not responsible. I'm not responsible. Just been living my life, man. Just trying to do what I want to do. Oh, right. you're a white kid of privilege. Okay, that's fine. But and we're already suffering from affirmative action and anti -discrim discrimination quotas and things like that. Uh, it's it, honestly, it's like, and you know, the, the the race hustlers, these guys, they don't want a solution. They don't want to give us a final bill and say. If the American government just pays us $17 trillion, we will shut up forever. You know that's not going to happen either, right? right? Right. So, like, what's the point? Right. What's well, the point? And the, and the funny thing is, is that the whole thing is weirdly racist, as we all know, because they, most African Americans in America are, to some degree, partly white. Barack Obama would... Barack Obama, who allegedly has no, is not a descendant of an American slave in any way, uh, would have to, according to this racial formula, would have to give, you know, his compensation to himself. He's, he's you know, he's half white. Most African Americans in America are part white. There's this, there's this well, really. And, and so, th so then we get into the identity politics and like, oh, you can identify as what it's like, but then. Yeah, what about like Nigerian, like Nigerian Americans and Jamaicans? They come here and they're like, they don't want anything to do with being tarred and feathered by this broad brush of like. The, I don't think they're like trying to say, "Oh, I'm a Jamaican. I'm I'm a Nigerian. I should get reparations too." Like for what? Oh no, they're they're, for they're who? The ones yeah, that it's I know, worse. I know. It's, it, 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 the ones that I know basically don't want to have anything to do with the African American movement. I know movement. that that's my impression too, and I'm like, so so who is it? So, yeah.
So we'll see how this. Oh, then, you know, out. you and I are supposed to have you and I are supposed to have opinions on this because we're uh, allegedly white males. But uh, I have a feeling like you and I are willing to have opinions on things we're not allowed to have opinions about because otherwise, how would you be a libertarian at this point in time? Yeah. Well. Exactly. Well, we, we've always been individualists of the obvious and really low order sort that we don't really pay attention to what uh, our betters tell us we may or may not do. We're going to think like we want to think. That's just an obvious point. Uh, and uh, and like you said, your ancestors came in 1900. Uh, my ancestors came, you know, on both sides of 1900, the Fond du Siècle, uh, the Belle Epoque, something like that, <laughs> to go back to our original conversation. And uh, and my people, you know, my ancestors, I, I have one of the great advantages over most Americans is that I can basically prove that I'm about as purebred of one thing as possible, or as inbred, if you prefer to say it. Uh, I'm I'm very thin. Uh, I'm about as thin as you can get. And uh, and so, you know, what did my ancestors do to anyone? You know, they were thralls to the Vikings, probably. Yeah. No, I know. So, like, the logic makes no sense, right? The justice makes no sense. They could say you have white privilege. That's all it can say. Yeah. You look white. Yeah, I look white. And I am white. I mean, it, to the extent that anybody's white. But, you know, we're off white. And uh, and blacks are off black. <laughs> <laughs> you know? True. So here we are. We've, we've been talking for almost two hours now. And uh, yeah. we've meandered. But we have to catch up. Before we can deal with a real philosophical uh, sure. issue, we have to catch up. We did. So formally, I'm going to thank you right now, and then I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions about what we want to do with what we just recorded. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> thank you. So what do you want to do with all this? 